I want to teach on this subject title this morning, I'm Salty. I'm Salty. I'm Salty comes from Matthew's gospel in chapter 5. It says this. It says that you shall be the salt of the earth. Jesus, the ultimate teacher, is giving us, it's going to be good this morning because Frank's in church, I'm telling you. God's going to, it, it's, 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 Jesus is telling us to make a difference. Christians are supposed to be salt. Now, I don't know how you can be salt and not influence things. I don't know how you can be salt and not change things. Because if you're salt, whenever you show up, you make an impact. I, I want to convince you during these next four weeks that I will be here preaching that salt is important. I want to impress upon you that all of you are leaders no matter what you think about yourself. Whether you feel like somebody else is a leader and that's not your job, you are a leader. And I can tell the quality of your life by who's leading it. And the person that is leading your life is you. You may be influenced by other people but you're still a leader. I want to really dive and teach you sometimes what college doesn't teach us is sometimes college makes us learn how to be great number twos, which is fine, but there is an aspect to life that you need to learn. You have to be a leader. And if you were a leader as a kid, maybe you wouldn't have got involved in some of the things we got involved in because we were not leaders. Jesus says to his disciples, you're the salt. Now, I don't cook. Don't judge me. Judge your mama. I, I don't cook much, but I try. And I try to make these grits. And I was reading the material on the paperwork that said you just add a little salt. I tried that, and I don't know if my biceps were a little too heavy, and when I took the first bite, I just said, this is too salty. Because salt, even though it's a little small grain, can change the entire flavor of a food. And this morning, I want to ask you, are you salty? Are you salty? No, no, no. You, you need to walk around and before you date somebody and ask them, are you salty? Because I don't want to be with somebody that can't leave. There's got to be some dynamic to where you're a leader, I'm a leader, two leaders coming together, building something great because marriage is not just achieved, it's built. So I, I need a leader in my life because I don't want to follow anybody. What you want to eat? I don't know where you want to go. I don't know what you want to go on vacation. I don't know what you want. No, somebody needs to know because somebody's got to be the salt and you got to lead. Genesis 37 is where we're going to be. I don't want to assume you know this passage of Scripture because we in our culture are not as biblically literate as the older culture. Joseph in this passage, Joseph 37, verse number 1. Genesis 37, Joseph's dad is named Jacob. Jacob is a trickster. He has a son named Joseph. Joseph is going to be a world changer. Now, notice this, Joseph was a world changer and never owned a company. Joseph worked for somebody and helped other people win and he won. 
There goes that principle about being great at being number two. Because if you help other people win, you will win. Some of us always want to win and we wonder why we're always losing. Genesis 31 says this, verse number five, one night Joseph had a dream. Now number four, verse four says his daddy loved him. His dad loved Joseph. Now I know you're not supposed to have favorite children, but scripture is pretty clear. There are instances where parents showed favoritism towards one, which created chaos for the child. So all of us parents who have our children who we particularly like one that does something a little different than the other, you can create a warlike scenario because one of them is being told that you're the most special. And the other ones are now jealous at the brother because he gets more love. Now here's verse number five. It says, four says that daddy loved Jacob. He loved him more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. Because he was born old, daddy was old and had Joseph, and it proved that daddy still had it. So, so he, loved, he loved Joseph. And verse number five says, one night Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. Number one about leadership. Be careful who you tell information. I'm going to help you today. Be careful who you tell information. Sometimes you should do tests. You should tell people something that's insignificant to see if it gets out. And if it gets out, then you know they can't be trusted. That was free. Genesis 37, verse number 5. One night, Joseph had a dream when he told his brothers, oh, let me tell you this. This will help you. If you are a hearer of a person's dream, that does not mean that gives you the right to call someone that you think knows them well to share their dream. If they shared it with you, they trusted you, not anybody else. Now, if they tell you, I told somebody else, then you have the permission to tell somebody else. Y'all church folks. I tell you something, you call someone else that you think knows me and you tell them the same thing. I ain't tell them, I told you. All right, let me, one, all right, let me get back to the verse. Listen to this dream, he said. We were out in the field trying up bundles of grain. Suddenly, my bundle stood up and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. His brothers responded, so you think you will be our king? Do you actually think well, you'll reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and the way he talked about them. That's important too. You got to understand, this is, this is for those who are winning. This is kind of a little, little head thing. If you're winning, your siblings are still your siblings. Just because you make more money than them doesn't mean you're not the younger one. And a lot of us feel like because you have the advantage in your personal life, it gives you rights over them because you're personally ahead of them. It doesn't. When I come around my siblings, it don't matter how many times I think I'm the pastor. These Negroids will make me feel like I am not a legitimate pastor every time. Why? Because you gotta remember you have a place with them. No matter how far you get, you still have a place with them. So now here it is. The time came now, then he told his father as well of his brothers, but he told his father and his father scolded him. Now the father that loved him, when he told the father to dream that you're gonna be serving under me, the father then had an issue. Like, hold up, this was all good until you start telling me I'm going to be under you. Number one that you got to understand for those of you who have in parental fights, if your parents are old, they're not going to change because you're young. Because you got a hip philosophy you think you're going to change your parents' attitude towards your thinking. No, 
some of our parents are going to be set their way forever. Forever. And you attempting to change them is going to make you more frustrated because you've got to realize it's easier for them to grow up than it is for them to grow down. That will help your relationship to understand that no, it's not that they don't love you, it's just that they are stuck in the way that they believe is the best. And just because you have a different way doesn't mean yours is better. Let me get back to my point. God, I want to begin by saying this, leadership is one of the most necessary ingredients one needs to lead a more effective life. Jesus was committed to turning followers into leaders. He desired Christians to lead by calling them salt. Salt is to food what leadership is to culture, its influence. When salt is implemented, it changes the dynamic of the structure of food, and leadership should change the dynamics of culture. I can assure you, you are a leader. You may lead a company, you may lead a family, you may lead children. If you're leading yourself, you're a leader. I want to visit the life of Joseph, which his name means increase, and talk about being salty. In the chats, why don't you just go ahead and put, I'm salty, I'm salty, I'm salty. Joseph is what I would label, and I think you should write it down, a visionary leader. Visionary leader means this. You see the end, but you see nothing in between. And many of you are visionary leaders. We get a lot of people that join this church who are visionary leaders, who have an idea, going to see Clarence, who have an idea that this is what I'm called to do. I am an entrepreneur. I see myself doing these great things. But just because you see yourself doing these great things doesn't mean you know how to get there. Let me help you. Did God give Joseph the dream? Yes. Did God give Joseph the roadmap on how to get there? No. And a lot of you have dreams. You just don't know how to get there. That's what I call visionary leader. A visionary knows the end, but they don't see the details in between. Man, I just see myself just doing this, and I just see myself doing that. That's great, but how are you going to get there? That's visionary leaders. I know what I saw. We're not questioning what you saw. But how do you put it into practical steps how you're going to get there? That's what leadership is about. Some of us who are lead, every leader should be submitted to another leader. You cannot tell me how to get there if you've never been there. That's why it's funny online where you see people trying to teach you how to be a millionaire and they're not one themselves. Okay, because in order for you to teach me how to get there, you got to be there. Vis Somebody say visionary leadership. Type it on the screen. Visionary leadership. Visionary leadership. Type it on the screen. Visionary leadership. God gives him a dream of the end. He doesn't comprehend the details, but just understands the end. Visionaries are not architects. Neither builders. You need both. So God gave me a dream. I want to start a pizza shop. Because you do know how God speaks to you as he gives you a dream. And he hopes the dream keeps you alive so much that every day you live, you're like, man, I just want to keep doing my dream. I just want to keep following this dream. But you, you may see the end, but you need an architect. An architect is someone who can draw your dream so that people can, I want to build a big house. What does it look like? I don't know. It just need to be big. Well, what you need is an architect. An architect will take that house that's in your head, put it on paper so that others can see it. How do you want your goals that you put on the top of the year, you know, we're halfway in the year, halfway in the year. How do you want them dreams to look like? Someone needs to draw it for you. 
You need to find someone who's willing to draw your dream for you. Just because I draw it for you doesn't mean I'm called to build it. Come on, church. I need a drawer and I need someone who can build it. And architects help you see what you want. A builder helps you build it. I want a, I want a beautiful marriage. I want to be a power couple, whatever that means. Um, you need an architect. You need someone who can help you see what that looks like. A couple that's been married 30 years, 50 years, 70 years, 60 years. Th that's an architect. They can show you this is what it looks like to be married happy for 50 years. But then you need someone who can help you build it. You need a coach that walks you along the road and says, you need to go home. Because if you don't go home, you won't have 70 years. You need to stop texting your business to people who are not married, who are single, about your husband or your spouse. Because when you tell them who are single, doesn't mean single people can't give a good advice, but they don't have enough experience to tell you about being married. Child, I would leave him. That might be the, never mind. All right, let me, let me keep going. So, so, so you, you need people who can help you build it. I need a builder on my team. Someone who can say, give me the pieces of your dream and watch me put it into play. You still got to do the work even though you got an architect and a builder. Because an architect and a builder are not the visionary. They take instructions from the visionary. Here's what you got to be careful on. Sometimes you hire an architect and a builder and they take your vision and make it their own. No, 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 no. This is my vision. I tell you what to do with it. And you build it according. No, well, I kind of like it. Like, no, no, no. Then go build your own. Visionary leadership is, listen, if I go, let me give you a great example. Chick-fil-A hires me because they're anointed by God. And I go in there and I'm like, you know what, Chick? Because, <laughs> you know, we get real familiar when we've been there for a while. After I pass my 90 days, you know what, Chick? Um, I really don't like the way the fries are. I think if we changed up the fries a little bit, I think it would be great if we could change up the fries just slightly. And Chick would tell me, well, I don't need you. Our fries have been working for many years. We could do chicken, we could do french fries, we could, if we wanted to, do the COVID vaccine and it would run smoothly because we have a system. You are hired to say, how may I help you? Not, I want the fries this way. Well, God has called me to my own destiny. Well, then go work your own destiny. But when you work for Chick, you got to understand, I'm here to build Chick's vision. If you got a job, your job is to build the visionary's vision. If I'm at Chick-fil-A, how may I serve you? I don't care if you made me mad. I don't care if you ticked me off. I am here to build Chick's vision. And even though you make me mad, I understand if I do Chick right, Chick will do me right. And some of you aren't being promoted because you keep trying to be the Chick. Text somebody else, stop trying to be the chick. Stop trying to be the chick. Stop trying to be the chick. Do what God called you to do and do it well. <laughs> Let me tell you a story, it's pretty funny. I told you I don't cook. And many of you judge me. I felt. But I, I did a, I did a uh, more Memorial Day, I did a party at my house. Did party. Pastors do party. No cameras. No, I'm just so we did this party at my house. And I I, I invited, a, you know, I try to invite new people to the house from time to time. And I invited with somebody that I knew for a while. I'm not gonna mention his name. And I said, you know, I don't cook. But I trust you can cook. He said, PD, I got you, I can cook. I'm a master griller. Now we work out together. So he looked like he eats a lot. So I said, hey, go ahead and cook. And I mean, he was doing a good job. He had the burgers. He said, PD, I need butter. I said, butter for what? And he put butter on the burgers. I said, wow, he's a builder. 
he showed me this is how the burger need to look. I said, man, he's a builder. So he goes and he, he puts the burgers together. And I'm like, man, this guy, you're doing exactly what I wanted. He's, he's building the burgers in such a way. He like, PD, when, 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 you, when you put it on the grill, it need to be at this temperature. So, so he puts it on the grill. Also, I'm like, man, this guy's dope. He's amazing. Then after a while, we ate a burger. Man, the burger was good. I said, how are you single? And you can make burgers this good. He said, this is what I do for a living, PD. I used to go into my, my cousin's house. I, cook, I grilled for him. I'm grilling for you today. It's all good. Then all of a sudden, we're sitting there. And I see fire coming out the grill. And the fire is literally by my, because the grill is against close to the house. And I, I get out, I, I say, hey, hey man, I don't think this is supposed to be the vision that I had. I don't remember seeing smoke filling in the air and, and he's saying, oh find the grill. Okay, let me go over there. He walked gingerly over there. And, and he opens it and a whole blame of fire goes up. And I'm thinking to myself, this is not what I hired you for, chick. I didn't hire you to catch my house on fire. And then all of a sudden, one of the guys that I know knows how to grill real well too. He's a, he's a, he's a works for Disney, but he's a union worker. So he's in the pool and I say, hey man, my house is about to be on fire. He look at his clock like he's not on schedule to be working. So I'm sitting there thinking about my house about to catch on fire. I got this union worker. Then the union worker, he, you know, he, he gets out the pool like he's in a model show. He steps out the pool and then all of a sudden he come out there and then they lift the grill. And this is when you need people because you need to stay in your lane. The fire's blowing up. I say to myself, I'm going to go get the hose. Because I thought if there's a fire, water will pull it out. Judge your mama. Stop judging me, okay? I ain't know you couldn't put water on the grease fire. So all of a sudden, one of the other guys, this is why you can't have certain people in your house. One of the other guys who owns a construction business looks at me and says, babe, why my stuff is on fire? Babe, get him a business card because he's going to need new drywall and stucco. That's the type of people you don't want at your house. That's, that's the type of folk you definitely don't want at your house. The house, the thing is blowing. All of a sudden, then they go out, they just fan it a little bit, and then the flames go out. And I said, wow. And you know what the audacity of the griller tells me? He said, should never had to grill that close to your house, man. That's what it is. <laughs> but when you're a visionary, sometimes you've got to be careful that you don't give your vision to somebody because if they have it too long, they'll do it their way. So let me get through this. So number two, my house did not catch on fire. Praise the Lord. It, it, it did not catch on fire. Praise the Lord. And then it had a little black smoke on it. So I was like, oh my God, how am I going to get this black smoke off the building? The construction guy says, we do that too. We can handle that for you too. All right, let me tell you this. He was called to leadership, but crippled by immaturity. God's calling is yours. God's calling, my bad, God's calling is his, but maturity is yours. God's calling is his, but maturity is yours. Whenever God gives you a dream, you got to mature in it. You're just not automatically a leader. You learn how to be a leader. You're going to make mistakes as a leader. That's part. And those of you graduating, you're going to make mistakes on the career path you want to choose. But that's part of being a leader. You learn these mistakes and then you pivot from these mistakes. Because Joseph was immature. He told his brothers a dream about them serving him. Here's one thing you need to learn about having a vision. If your vision only serves you, you won't have people a part of it. Your vision should go beyond yourself. Now, there's a whole other piece I want to teach about leadership because we're teaching people how to manage failure. And a lot of gospel preaching, especially in minority communities, is like, oh, you know, you were down, started from the bottom while we're here, which is great. 
But we also need to teach people there's a guilt that comes with success too. Because so many of your peers may not have it, it seems like you've done something illegal to get it. All right, let's keep going. And you wonder, and that's why we always say, like, how come people who make it, who have resources, only hang out with people who have resources? Because it's hard to tell somebody, hey man, I got a million dollars in my account, and then they feel like you, you slide in them. Because every level of leadership has a language. This is so important. He was crippled by immaturity. Ooh, this is so good. Sometimes too much detail detours or destroys destiny. Sometimes too much detail delays or destroys, sometimes too much detail detours or destroys destiny. When you know too much, it stifles your own growth. I'll never forget, I was working at a church, my pastor was a pretty decent guy, and I walked up to him and said, hey man, I just wanna ask you a question. When are you gonna promote me? When are you going to give me more money? And he remembered, he looked at me and said, sometimes too much detail destroys destiny. Because if you know too much, then you start operating on the premise of what you know. So now I'm not serving because I want to serve. I'm serving because I know what the end is going to be. So sometimes God will hide the details so that you can serve with your heart and not because you've seen the end result. Now, God will show you the end result in your dream to keep you motivated, but he won't show you the distractions and the challenges in between because you won't pursue the dream. Y'all ready for this? This is probably the, this is, okay, so some of you are mentors to mentees. This is very important. I think I've learned, at least from a ministry context, and I think even from a business context, too, this is important. Don't let payment pervert purpose. Let me say it again. Don't let payment pervert purpose. I've seen so many people ditch purpose for payment. Right? Like, there are times where you need to ditch something for payment. But I do believe that there are times that we ditch purpose for payment. Bro, they finna pay me X amount. But what you're getting, my, my, I work for a guy who's, 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 who's Caucasian. He um, owns Millennium Partners, brought the Millennium Mall to town. And when I first met him, he said, I need to come work for him. I was like, bro, I don't even know you. He said, God gave me a dream that we're going to work together. And in my head, I thought, oh, I wish God would have gave me that dream too. Because you got to be careful. People manipulate you with what God said. Here's rule number one. If you ever meet with me and tell me God said, and you ask me for my opinion, I'm going to look at you and say, for what? Who am I to fight against God? I'd rather you just be honest and say, I feel. I sense. But if you say God, and then all of a sudden, five years down the road, it go bad, and you call me and say it's not working, I'm going to say, well, remember when we met, you said God said? That's what, I'm not going to fight God. I feel. I, so, so what was I talking about? Oh, oh yeah, the guy from Malaya. So he says, I want you to come work for me. Now, I've, I've gotten recruited by so many other people, but what this guy has given to me far surpasses what my 1099 says. So sometimes you could leave a place for, now, here's what I don't want you to think. I need to stay where I'm at because that's what pastor's saying. My job, they've been slapping me every day I come to work and I don't need to leave and get a better job because of payment. I'm simply saying there's, there's a duality to this. Where I was, I needed to leave so I can get to someplace bigger. Right Where I am right now in this state, I don't need to go anywhere because what I'm getting from him sometimes exceeds what someone could pay me. You understand what I'm saying? If I can use your stuff for free, 
that don't show up on my W-2, but I got to use your boat for free. So sometimes as a leader, you got to look full circle. You also got to be careful too, because you could be, a, you could be loyal to a place that's dead. And I know some of you are going to take that and run with it. You can run with either side. You could be loyal to a place that's dead. So you got to balance that out as a leader to know what shall I do? Right? Okay. All right. Now, here, here, here's, here's what it is. Um, if you're following good leadership, good leadership always has a path for you. Now, remember... All leaders don't have to tell you the path. That's why you get buy-in from leaders. Because here's the thing. You never want to lose a good leader in your corner. Never. Listen to this. Listen to this. This is so important. Dreaming is free. Making decisions is expensive. Oh, this was, that was too, man, that was, listen, I want to buy the CD myself. Dreaming is, we don't buy CDs no more. Dreaming is free. Decisions are expensive. That's why as a leader, you need builders on your team. You need architects on your team to help you make decisions that make sense. Don't make a decision just because you feel like it. You need spiritual leaders to help you make a decision. That doesn't mean all spiritual leaders' word is final authority because I've seen that abuse too. I've seen people say, my pastor got to approve you before I marry you. No, I do not. One, I'm not getting shot by anybody <laughs> for somebody I'm not with. Praise the Lord. Oh, so you, that man told you, oh, give me my nine. Let me find where he at. I, no, no, no. I, player, I didn't say she don't need to be with you, prayer. I, I didn't say that. I said, that's, I don't believe that. No, no we, get, we, get, <laughs> we get spiritual advice. How, what do you think, pastor, about this? What do you, how do you feel about this? And what do you think? And then I get other leaders that I trust, like, hey, pops, what do you think about this? And how do you feel about that? Because even though they're not the visionary, their wisdom can give me ingredients to make a good decision. I love my guys that call young ladies that, hey, I got a decision to make. What you think? Well, let, let's, let's tell you what to do. You make, the, you make the decision. But let me give you a picture of what it looks like. I'll never forget a man called me. He said, Pastor, I need to make a decision. I got a job, two jobs offering me a job. One is a big company. They're offering me $100,000 a year plus a 30% bonus and also stock options. Another startup company that's $5 million a year is going to pay me $100,000, a little less than this company, than the bigger company. What do you think I should do? Well, first off, I'm not going to make that decision for you but I will give you decision parameters that will help you make the decision. So with a corporate job, it requires you to travel to Tampa. That means you'll be on the road for two hours minimum every day. And if you get traffic, that means you'll be on the road for three hours. Times that by two, that means you'll be on the road for six hours. Your sons are playing basketball. That means you won't be able to make it to their games because it's going to require you to travel a lot. So how much is the money worth versus your time? You're going to make a lot of money, but you're going to miss the most significant days of your son's life. Is it worth it? Now, what you could do is you could go to the other employer, be honest with them, let them know where you're at, and they can make a decision based on what you tell them. He said, Pastor, that's what I'm going to do. He calls me back and says, Pastor, you won't believe it worked. I told the smaller company what I was trying to do. They gave me $15,000 more. They gave me a higher stock. The man ended up making a package of $180,000 a year. Because you go to leaders to help you make good decisions. You don't make big decisions without leaders. So dreaming is free. Making decisions is expensive. Here's something very important. Those of you who have a business, whatever, i got to hurry up because I'm running out of time. People don't have to believe in your dream, but as salt, 
you must influence them to show them how your dream serves them. If your dream only serves you, nobody wants to be a part of it. Let me hurry up. This is so important. Joseph, I want, I want to give you this. My perspective towards you determines my attitude towards you. My perspective towards you determines my attitude towards you. When you go to people who only see you as who you were, they will never see you for who you are. Because we all have evolutions of our lives. So I, I, did, I did this writing online of all the different things that I do because sometimes people freeze you where they met you. So you, you didn't catch up that I, I evolved into something else. All you know me as, Frank, you're a cop. You can't be a business person. Because all I'd known you for was you on Rio Grande, speaking Creole, pulling people over, helping them, doing all the jail things and all that type of stuff that, that you have to do and all those things that are required of law enforcement. But they don't know that you have another side to you that is business oriented. And some people don't want to accept the new you. Okay, this is the last one. Joseph's dream wasn't bad, but the way he handled his dream. Because sometimes your dream is good, but you can't kill the people who supported you because of your dream. I'm, I'm, I'm finna blow it. I don't need, I don't, I don't need. Every place God places you is important. It's only in the church that we can't leave a place healthy. It's almost like we got to create drugs. It's not just church. It's just people who have suffered a lot of trauma. We have to create a reason to leave a relationship and not just leave it in good terms. I got to make up a reason in my mind to why you're dirty so I can justify my leaving. As opposed to just being healthy and saying, you know what, I love you. I'm just looking for more in this season. We can still kick it. We can still go eat barbecue. We can still eat chitlins. I don't eat chitlins. But we can do all those things. We can eat, still eat spaghetti, all those types of things. But, it does, but because we have created a mindset that if I don't destroy you, I don't feel justified. There's a great way, this is, if I could teach a series, I would teach a series called Healthy Endings. Because some of us don't know how to have healthy endings. Every friendship you have, just because you don't talk every day, doesn't mean it's got to be a bombshell like, oh, I don't like you because you were talking about me. No, why can't it just be like, we just don't talk every day, but we're still friends. Listen, y'all, as I'm closing and saying this. You only go as far as your leadership capacity. If you want to lead further, you got to find new teammates to help you lead. When you can't lead further and you try to lead, you cripple your team. Remember this, and this is it. You don't go as far as your dream. You go as far as the team. You got a big dream? So does everybody. Show me the team. Show, show me your team. Now, there are seasons where it's just going to be you. You're going to be grinding. You're going to be trying to do your thing, Joseph, and all that. And as I get further into this series, I want to teach you how do you handle it 
when you're winning and you got to serve the people who try to kill you. Because because you can't because you can't you can't use your advantage to kill them. <laughs> Y'all ain't talking to me. Oh, as we get to Father's Day and we talk about how they ripped his coat. That every great leader, even though you win, you still got to go through the ripping. And most of the times, the rippings do not come from people you don't know. They always come from people you know. So you need to be salty and you need to read leadership books, John Maxwell, all these different types of books. Because in order for you to grow, you got to be a good leader. Got to be a good leader. And can I say this before? I know I might get canceled online. I'm sorry. But as a community, we have some inferiority complexes that we have to talk about. That without even knowing it, they prohibit us from allowing other people to lead with us. So what typically happens is when we see another good leader, we end up killing them so that we can shine. It's not that they're bad, it's just you don't even know you're doing it. Subconsciously, you make up in your mind a reason not to believe in the person next to you so it can justify you being the sole leader. Y'all ain't talking to me this morning. I'm about to go in the pool. It's all good. So listen, I want, I want, I want I, seriously, you have to have a team around you to help you see your blind spots as a leader. If we're going to influence the world, we're not going to influence the world by just having a great church. Amen. If you got a good church, amen. I ain't going to change the world. You're going to change the world by going into your job and they say, man, something about you is different. I want to put you in leadership. Here's a powerful statement, and I promise this is the last one. There was a company guy that said this. He said, I would have had a better dad if my dad had a better boss. Did y'all, y'all catch that? That I would have a better dad if my dad had a better boss. Which means that the boss was in a position to make an impact in the life of the employee, but caused him so much trauma and challenge that he wasn't able to function at home. So you who are in the position of powerful leadership, you should be the one that your people say, you know what? My life is better because my dad had a great boss. It's healthy leadership. By your hands, let's pray. Father, I thank you for helping us be better leaders. You said, I want you to be salt. Salt is a very influential thing. So God, help me. Help my brother, help my sister. Help us to be salt. Salt that changes communities. Salt that changes people's lives. God, help me and my brother and sister learn how to be salt. It's in the matchless and the mighty name of Jesus.